so for the next hour and a half or so, we're going to discuss post-tension slabs on ground design. Uh, I'm going to start off with saying that um, the slab on ground methodology is uh, specific effectively to two, three, maybe four story uh, wood or metal stud bearing structures. It is not governed by ACI 318. So if you were hoping for a mat slab for uh, column supported buildings, you may be disappointed. Hopefully it's still fairly interesting. But this is primarily uh, geared towards conventional wood frame construction, typically apartments or homes that are on expansive soils. So moving forward, um, if any part of this uh, webinar is interesting, there is an entire uh, two chapters about the slab on grade design methodology for this type of application in my book, Post-Hitching Concrete Principles and Practice. Uh, if you've taken any of these webinars before that I've given, basically this book is an introductory book. That's the first half of it. That's what's used to teach post-hitching concrete. And the university systems, um, we actually uh, have it at, being taught right now at UCLA Cal Poly Slow, Cal State LA, and actually it's being used at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, just, we just found out. So uh, if you are interested, the first half is the intro to PT Concrete, and the last half of the book is the construction aspects, uh, garages, podiums, hotels, diaphragms, uh, slabs on ground, construction issues. So there's a lot of pictures in the last half of the book that kind of relate more to what um, I do on an everyday basis using post tension concrete. Uh, there's an ebook and a hard copy available through SK Ghosh if you are interested. So this is what we're going to be focused on, design of PT slabs on ground. Now this is a methodology, and I'll get into the history a little bit later on, that was designed specifically or developed specifically by the Post-Tensioning Institute. Uh, they've had a number of iterations of this methodology, which I'll get into in a little bit. But the one thing I want to stress, no pun intended, is that this methodology is exempt from ACI 318. Uh, if there's any plan checkers or other engineers that have had plan check comments, um, this is exempt through section 1.1.7. It's its own entity. There are a lot of things that would technically violate uh, ACI 318 standards for elevated structures. So this document in itself is basically a self-contained use as it is and you not reference, you know, all the other ASE 7s, ACI 318 and all that other kind of stuff that you would do for elevated structures. So even if you have a working knowledge of post-tensioned concrete for elevated structures, kind of forget everything you knew and we're going to focus on this aspect of it, which is almost a completely different methodology uh, for post-tensioning. It almost has nothing to do with elevated structures. Um, the typical applications, as I mentioned, are single family residential. That's probably the biggest historical application of PT slabs on ground. Uh, these uh, homes are usually built in the Southwest, uh, California, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, um, Nevada, if I didn't already say that. Um, Louisiana, anywhere that you have expansive soils, which typically is in the bottom half of the U.S., and they're most severe where you actually have a lot of rain coupled with a lot of, you know, not rain or really dry areas where the soil can dry out. The other application is multifamily residential, which is going much more popular in my neck of the woods in Southern California or in even Northern California. The apartment market is obviously booming right now. And so these very, very large plates, I mean, 100, 200, 300 feet long um, foundations are being uh, built to support uh, two, three, and four stories of wood construction. So the same methodology applies, but obviously the concrete is a lot more. There's some more issues to deal with, with tendon lengths, losses, and stuff like that. But the concept is the same. Now, the one thing that's consistent between the single family and the multifamily is this is primarily a bearing wall system foundation. If you have posts everywhere, or it's a column supported structure, let's say it's a podium slab, that in theory holds up four stories of wood, but it's the slab, the podium slab that holds it up, and then the columns hold up the slab, this methodology does not apply. It is specific to bearing walls that go onto the ground. The entire methodology is effectively based upon a perimeter bearing wall system of roughly about two kips a linear foot. When you start dealing with a podium slab or um, any type of column supported structure, even if it's on expansive soils, it, this methodology, again, does not apply. And I have a, actually right now I'm getting into somewhat of an um, 
interesting conversation with a geotech on a podium slab we're designing where they have written a report that says you need to use the PTI method because it's expansive soils. And I'm trying to explain that when you have columns at 250 kips or 300 kips compared to two kips a linear foot of bearing wall, the two things are totally incompatible. You can't use this methodology on a quote unquote column supported structure. The loads are just too large. So again, if you're getting into a situation with a geotech uh, or a soils engineer or something similar where they're saying, oh, we have expansive soils, that's one thing. But unless you have a conventionally wood frame metal stud building with bearing walls, this methodology does not apply. Now, having said that, you can use it for commercial and retail buildings, but the premise is still the same. It's primarily a bearing wall structure.